Welcome to TechnoViews, a series of interviews, videos, and podcasts with major figures in the humanities and social sciences on topics at the intersection between technology, society, and culture in Asia and the world. My name is Joseph Bosco. I am a research associate in the Department of Anthropology at Washington University in St. Louis, and also adjunct associate professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Our guest today is Dr. Sylvia Lindner, author of the book Prototype Nation, China and the Contested Promise of Innovation, published in 2020 by Princeton University Press. The book has won two major book prizes, the 2021 Francis L.K. Xu Book Prize from the Society for East Asian Anthropology and the 2022 Joseph Levinson Prize for China Scholarship from the Association for Asian Studies. Hi, Sylvia. Welcome to TechnoViews. Thank you so much. It's such a delight to be here. Dr. Lindner is an anthropologist and associate professor at the University of Michigan in the School of Information and director of the Center for Ethics, Society, and Computing. Sylvia, your book is about the maker movement in China. I put maker in quotation marks because people may not know that term. Can you tell our listeners what this is and how and why you decided to focus your research on this phenomenon? Sure. So the maker movement was really a thing that started unfolding in the years following the 2007 eight financial crisis. So this was a time when really uh, for the first time in, in sort of decades, people began uh, to think more critically about technology. So think about the early 2000s, you know, people were still sort of excited about the early days of Google and Facebook. There was a lot of optimism in the air. And the 2007 and 8 financial crisis had really brought home to a lot of people who had been sort of in, in excited about technology, had brought home that these technological promises of individual empowerment, of societal transformation didn't really work for everyone the same way. Um, and so this was the time when people, especially people working in the arts, in design, in technology, began turning to what many began to then later call the maker movement. So a maker, these advocates um, stipulated, was someone who, rather than buying the latest technology that Apple or Google produced, would make, create their own technology. So rather than being dependent on a big corporation or on the state, these people would tinker and experiment to make their own devices. And they really saw that as um, a form of empowerment, but also as a way to recuperate these so-called broken promises of technology. So they thought if they built technology in a way that was open, so many people in the maker movement ascribed to open source technology, to making technology available to a lot of other people, so they believed that if they made technology that was hackable, that was modifiable by other people, they could indeed deliver on these earlier promises that technologies has, had made for decades that technology would transform society. And how did you decide to focus on China? Um, from the book, you seem to have been involved from the earliest sprouts of the movement there. I was uh, in China uh, for the years actually before the maker movement became sort of a big global phenomenon. I first came in the years of 2006 and seven as a PhD student. And already back then, I was really interested in these intersections of computer science, data science, and, and, and the arts and people who were kind of experimenting with internet technology and what that would mean for Chinese society at that time. This was also a time in 2007 and 8 where a lot of American tech corporations began turning towards China as a site of investment. So, for instance, Intel, Microsoft, IBM and other companies framed China as the, the next billion users. And as I was doing my early research as a PhD student, I was just struck by how much the West had framed China just as a site for use. But what I saw in China back then was actually a lot of hacking and making and tinkering and, and, and creating with technology. And so I decided that I really wanted to focus on that. And then I was very lucky. I happened to be in the right place at the right time. I was doing my dissertation field work uh, for a year. I conduct ethnographic research and I happened to be with this eclectic group of people 
who worked at the intersections of computing, entrepreneurship, and the arts, and they happened to start China's first makerspace. And then I traced that movement, right, from its early inceptions all the way to its intersections with manufacturing and finance capitalism later on. Yeah, very good. Now, it might be useful for our listeners and for readers of the book to have you describe your methods. Uh, most of our listeners to this podcast are anthropologists, so they'll understand participant observation and ethnography. But I'm sure many are curious about how fieldwork and data collection can work in industrial settings, especially in China, where uh, companies are often secretive and worried about foreign competitors. I conducted fieldwork in a variety of settings. So on the one hand, I conducted research in these very um, uh, grassroots community spaces, maker spaces, hacker spaces, co-working spaces, incubator spaces. These spaces really saw themselves as democratic, as participatory. And so as a researcher, as I have a technical background from my undergraduate degree. I know how to design and write code. I had a fairly straightforward access to some of these spaces because people saw me, even though I'm, I'm from Europe originally and I'm studied in the United States, they saw me as someone who is like them. So they really identified to be part of a global international community of technological makers. So access there was interesting, I think, and, and fairly straightforward. What was challenging, however, was often to, uh, for me later on, to be a woman in some of these technology spaces. And I experienced this not only to be a challenge in China, but also in Silicon Valley. My research was very multi-sided. I conducted quite a bit of research also in the United States, in Europe, and in other parts of Asia. And um, especially as the maker movement mo transitioned from this hobbyist grassroots environment into a space that became investable, where big tech firms and investors came in to see making as sort of this next big thing that they were excited about, uh, the more entrepreneurial the space became, the more masculine the space became as well. And in many ways, um, when I was doing research in an incubator um, in Shenzhen, in the, in the south of China, their access... Um, was much harder just in terms of I was often one of the, the very few women in, in these environments. And, and so this was a process of constant negotiation, including going into factories. A lot of the startups who I was researching at that time had tight collaborations with factories. And there too, you have to be um, quite cognizant both of being a foreigner in the space, but also you are made aware that you are a woman in that space. So I had to deal with sexual harassment at times. And that, that was really challenging um, uh, to, to um, experience. And, um, you know, as most of us do, as you know, right, as anthropologists and ethnographers, we end up writing about some of these experiences. And that was um, something that took me a while, though, because some of the research that I had done in these tech tech masculine kind of investment spaces was between 2014, uh, sorry, between 2012 and 15. And it took me, I would say, at least two years to really have the confidence to also write about this. And now everyone tells me that this work where I talk about gender and race in these incubator spaces is some of the most impactful work, but it was also the most personally challenging thing to write about. Yeah, I, I, that, I, I would agree with that. Uh, that is part of the, one of the most interesting aspects of the book, yes. Now, the book shows how making is associated with play, experimentation, and tinkering, qualities that many Chinese you interviewed associated with the West and more specifically with America. But you note that making was appropriated by the CCP as part of the state's tactics of hegemony because it functioned not by coercion, but by promising happiness via transformation. Can you explain how that appropriation happened and how it served the state, maybe through an example? I love that you asked me this question because we have just witnessed in China the conclusion of the party congress um, where there's a lot of political transformation underway in China, which I will comment um, in a little bit as well. But one of the leaders, the, the who is now former premier of China, Li Keqiang, um, who was still in office in 2015, played a central role, actually, in this appropriation of making by the CCP. So um, uh, what happened in 2015 is that 
uh, Premier Lee Keqiang visited one of these very small hacker spaces that had opened up its doors in the city of Shenzhen in 2010. And that was radical. You must imagine, as you just said, these spaces were identified with tinkering, with experimentation, grassroots. They were often very messy and small spaces. So no one would expect the prime minister of China on an official state visit to go to one of these tiny spaces. But yet there Li Keqiang was in 2015, and the visit was documented vividly by the state media. Li Keqiang was depicted side by side. These young men who were proudly sort of proclaimed as the next builders and future makers of the nation. And then Li Keqiang comes back home to Beijing and announces a new policy. And this was a policy that was written around three key terms, which would loosely translate into English as something like innovation and entrepreneurship amongst the people or for the people. And what was... Um, really sort of the consequence of this major policy in 2015 is that the central government basically asked regional governments, so think all over China, not only city governments, but also small district level governments to make existing resources available to set up these so-called maker spaces or incubator spaces to educate Chinese citizens to become not only makers of technology, but entrepreneurs. And the language around that was really um, framing this policy in what we would call techno-optimistic, almost Silicon Valley-like terms, right? This would bring about uh, societal transformation. This would bring about a happy, glorious future for the Chinese nation. And this also coincided with several other policies that had been put in place a little bit before and a little bit after um, as well as Xi Jinping's, the president's rhetoric around building an optimistic, forward-looking nation, the Chinese dream, which really positioned China through a language and a promise of building a happy, optimistic society, and that these makers, citizens who transformed themselves into these entrepreneurial change makers would be the ones who would lead China and that future um, to, to come into realization. And so it was also a departure from earlier language where um, often uh, state rhetoric focused on a sort of lack, that China was lacking something. So this was really a transition into um, uh, focusing on that China actually had to offer something, which was then also often referred to as building an indigenous innovation economy. So innovation that was um, in terms of its characteristics, fundamentally Chinese, and that would pitch well on a global in a global market of finance speculation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. The major concept in the book is the idea of the socialist pitch. Um, can you explain what that is? So typically, we understand pitching as something that a startup has to do in order to draw investment. So, for instance, a small tech company goes to see an investor and articulates why their team and their envisioned product is unique and worthy of investment. And this pitching often draws investment because it, of its promise. It promises scale. It promises to scale something that is still a prototype into something that is not only becoming a product, but something that many people will be considering worthy of investment. So when we hear the socialist pitch, this might sound like a contradiction because pitching is all about fundraising. It's about drawing investment. It's about scaling and acceleration, right? And so I play purposefully with that contradiction in the book to highlight how investors in the tech industry and startups alike had drawn from a socialist language in order to position their work as enabling societal change. So this was a time, again, uh, this, this really began taking shape in the years following the 2007 and 8 financial crisis, as I mentioned earlier, where people more broadly, also in the, in the media, in the United States in particular, began associating technology with things like labor exploitation, ruthless capitalist expansion, 
and even surveillance technology. This really now we are more familiar with these terms like surveillance capitalism, Georgiana Zuboff's book on this topic, right? And documentaries have really sort of um, raised sort of more broad awareness amongst many other publications, you know, on, on the sort of notion that technology isn't just always a good thing. But in the years following the financial crisis, more and more people started to feel sort of suspicious about that. And this was the time when tech investors and startups began turning towards the socialist rhetoric to say, actually, with if we design technology production in a way that's open source, we can enable and democratize uh, design and production um, in a way that even... Um, you know, changes industrial production itself and um, returns ownership over the means of production to the people. So there was a lot of even indirect references to Karl Marx um, by people like, for instance, Chris Anderson, who wrote a book on this topic, um, but who, of course, himself was also a major investor and, and started his own 3D printing company at that time. So... So basically, and this is just one example of a broader uh, tendency at the time where people across investment and the tech industry strategically utilized uh, references to socialism, even communism, to position themselves as doing work that was ethical, that was committed to this promise of democratizing technology innovation, and actually, the references to socialist values was what brought funding, what, 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 you know, it brought other people in, especially tech corporations and people who were working in these companies who were like, but we don't agree with what's happening. We want radical change, right? So it was the promise of kind of a return to a more socialist ideal that allowed these people actually to fundraise even more. So it's, there's an irony, of course, to that. And the socialist pitch as a, contra as a concept um, attempts to speak to this very contradiction. Yeah, interesting. Now, it's interesting that you note in the book that the term for maker in Chinese, chuang ke, implies innovation and entrepreneurship. The English term suggests more tinkering, experimentation, and play. Do you think the maker movement in China is more profit-oriented or linked to supposed traditional ideas of being one's own boss? I think that's a really important question because uh, the Chinese term chuang ke was something that uh, Chinese makers themselves came up with. Uh, when they hosted one of these first big maker events in China, where they invited a lot of people also from the United States and from elsewhere. And this was a time where a lot of, this was in 2010, a lot of people in the international maker scene had asked their peers in China to explain to them what was uniquely Chinese about making. They were like, but what, what are you guys doing in China? Is it just a copy? of what we are doing in San Francisco, in New York, or in Berlin. And a lot of the Chinese makers who I spent a lot of time with at that time for my research were really frustrated by this. They were like, oh, you know, why do we have to demonstrate that we are so different, right? And But then they took that to heart and were like, I guess we do have to pitch ourselves in a way that's legible, and we have to pitch ourselves to the Chinese government uh, to avoid shutdown or censorship of what we are doing. So they came up with this Chinese term, Zhuang, as, as you already noted, sort of connotes things like creativity and making, but it could also easily allude to innovation. So it's this very ambivalent term that's actually quite powerful because it both has a kind of positive connotation, in, especially in contrast to the Chinese term of heike, which is the Chinese term for hacker, which literally translated would mean something like illegal or black professional, right? And so it was associated with illegally hacking into systems. And so um, Chinese maker advocates at that time were keen to come up with a term that would neither um, sort of mean censorship in, in China, but would also speak to this global audience of demonstrating that there was something, Chinese, there was something uniquely Chinese about their work. And so Chuang Ke became this term that also stood for connections to manufacturing, to Shanghai entrepreneurship, this kind of creative appropriation. 
um, of copycat uh, production in the electronics production industry in the south of China. It came to basically represent that. Um, and it was a really important term, I think, without Chuang Ke itself, without that term, there might have never been government endorsement. Li Keqiang might have perhaps never visited the, the small little makerspace in, in Shenzhen um, because the term was so strategically also tied to these kind of positive connotations, right, of techno-optimism. And what I really want to stress here is, yes, oftentimes people associate with the maker movement in, in sort of a Western context, this kind of playful experimentation. But even in the Western context, there was quite big business actually behind making. DARPA at one point supported Maker Media, which was one of these big companies active at that time in America. And so making always had this, in the, in the, in the community broadly, there was always this tension between how much is this about play and experimentation and open source tinkering and even challenging the status quo and how much does it also reproduce the status quo so even voices within the international maker community early on especially women um, raised awareness how conservative the maker movement was also in a western context because it seemed to exclude a lot of people who didn't fit that kind of male hacker type either right so 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 in that sense the China's maker movement was basically sitting right in the middle of all of these debates, you know, how much is making commodification of of open source or how much is it uh, a pushback against against the tech industry? Yeah. So you write with annoyance in the book about the insistent questions from academic audiences about what is uniquely Chinese about your case. Can you elaborate on what the problem is with this type of question? Yeah, so I, I guess I shared a certain frustration with my interlocutors about this because my my interlocutors, a lot of the people who were active in China's maker movement, felt themselves pressured to quantify what they were doing, to actually pitch themselves, to make themselves legible to international investors, to people from abroad. And I wanted to highlight this um the, the challenges that came with that, including the, the sort of tacit form of stereotyping and race that, the racism that was inherent in some of, of, of these requests to articulate what was uniquely Chinese about that, um, because I also experienced it myself in a sort of scholarly environment, um, mostly because people had assumed that there was no Chinese innovation. There wasn't such a thing as innovation creativity um, in these spaces. And um, so often when I presented my work, I uh, would get pushback. I would get uh, people saying things like, oh, but in China, they just copy or uh, they cannot really catch up with the West anyway because they're not as good at software. Maybe they're good as hardware. So there was a lot of this kind of stereotyping in these commentaries. Well, at the same time, people then turned around and then demanded of people active in that maker scene in China to to really pitch themselves as, as having these sort of unique Chinese characteristics. And I wanted to highlight how this very framing of something is either uniquely American or uniquely uh, Chinese or uniquely German actually really is what investors demand of startups to do. You know, you have to pitch yourself as carrying some unique um, ability to scale a unique um, uh, a unique process or a unique approach to technology innovation that would then appeal to the investor. So I wanted to show the complicity of this very question, even when we ask it as scholars, in terms of how it feeds the machineries of finance speculation yet again. So that was really important for me to show. And what relevance, uh, what's the relevance of the book to larger audiences beyond academia? What kind of reception has the book gotten from non-academics? And maybe why should uh, lay people read this book? Why does it matter? Uh, this, is a, this is really important to me because I myself have worked in the tech industry for many years before I started my PhD. And I still work now also at the intersections of scholarship technology policy and activism. And so there's there's several ambitions I have with this book in terms of reaching audiences beyond beyond academia. So the one is uh, 
you know, to really sort of push back on sort of common stereotypical understandings of China and Chinese technology production. Um, we are in a moment, again, as I mentioned briefly earlier, where um, tensions between China and the United States are on the rise. Um, there is increasingly the notion that we are experiencing a tech cold war, an AI cold war between the two nations. Um, there is a lot of misunderstandings when it comes to how does actually technology production and innovation work on the ground in China. So I always have a hope to, with my work that is very ethnographic and very embedded, to reach people in legislation and in the tech industry in the United States, for instance, and beyond, of course, to challenge these common assumptions that, that people have about China and to really also think beyond either this image. Either, either China is sort of seen through this lens of copycat or it's now seen, seen through this lens of it's, it's a new threat. It's the surveillance state, right? It's, it's a top-down authoritarian regime, that, that kind of notion. And um, I think it's really important to shed light on how governance through technology in China actually works on the ground and works on a daily basis, how it's shifting, how there's experiments constantly unfolding in that space, both from a top leadership position, but also from regional, there's regional differentiation between how technology unfolds in, in policy making decision processes and governance processes. And so, so that's, that's really important for me to, to use this kind of on the ground research, um, to show, um, the complexity of, um, how technology is integrated both in society and also in governance processes. And understanding China doesn't just mean understanding Beijing. It means understanding the society in all its facets. And it also means understanding how power and control operate through technology in ways that extend beyond surveillance. Yes, surveillance is a very big issue, both in the United States and in China and elsewhere. Um, but control and power also operate through these promises of positivity, of optimism. And this is something I really focus on in the book because it seems counterintuitive, right? It seems, it seems, oh, but if, if technology just builds a better future, a better society, and there's this rhetoric of positive change, isn't this that just a good thing? And in my book, I attempt to show that this very rhetoric of producing positive feelings about the nation and even about the CCP is a form of control and power that we have to pay attention to because it in some ways isn't all that different from how these things operate in a Western context either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, Sylvia, and congratulations on your book and on the awards that the book has received already. Thank you all for listening. You have just listened to Dr. Sylvia Lindner on Technoviews. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Please send us your comments and suggestions in our website at scitechasia.org.